On January 23rd of this year, I was in Texas, and there was a raging storm. In the midst of thunder and lightning and waves of rain and threat of tornado, I stood in the sanctuary of the Ecclesia Church with 40 other people, 40 strangers, other beat up, bedraggled, burned out people of faith, hoping for a restorative retreat in the middle of a raging storm. The liturgist leading the retreat ask us to sing in unison from Psalm 27. I am sure I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Yes, I will see the goodness of God. Hold firm, trust in the Lord. In the middle of all the thunder and lightning, he said, sing again. I'm sure I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I stopped singing. I wasn't sure about anything. Just a few days earlier, I had picked up one of my adult children from spending six months in treatment for addiction. And within 30 minutes of their release, that beast of a disease grabbed them by the throat again. As everyone around me was singing, tears were streaming down my throat. I couldn't sing. I couldn't hold firm. I did not trust God. The struggle of addiction was not something new in our family. I've struggled with addiction. And I know all too well that two steps forward and three steps back dance of addiction that has scared the people I love half to death whether I will survive in the land of the living. But on this particular day, the story of my adult children and my story collided to produce a storm within that was greater than the storm without. And I was filled with fear and emptied of faith. And that brings us to our text this morning in the Gospel of Luke. One day, Jesus got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing and he awoke and rebuked the wind and the waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said to them, where's your faith? And they were afraid. And they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this? That he commands even wind and water, and they obey him. <laughs> I empathize with the disciples. They are understandably freaking out because Jesus does not seem to care that they are in a raging storm. The disciples are filled with fear and emptied of faith because Jesus is not acting like a concerned friend, much less a Messiah. And so they yell at him. And when it comes down to it, who hasn't yelled at God or at the very least stopped singing during the storms of life? Who hasn't wondered about the goodness of God in the land of the living? See, the disciples joined Jesus expecting some things. Expecting things to work out a certain way. I mean, their nets would catch more fish than they could eat. In fact, they would probably never be hungry. Their friends who were sick would be healed, and even the dead would be raised, and the corrupt government would certainly eventually be toppled by this miracle-working Messiah ending persecution and fractious fighting. At the very least... They wouldn't have to worry about wind and waves, raging storms. Well, let's be honest. 
we've joined up with Jesus expecting certain things. And when God does not make these seemingly simple things happen, we wonder why God is not doing what we want God to do. We wonder, does God care? I mean, this week I thought about the role that fear plays in all of this because in the end, it's the desire for our stories to unfold in certain ways that creates fear in us. Since fear is about not getting what we want or what we want being taken away. And fear is what the disciples, these fishermen, experienced in a boat that day when the storm, unlike any they had seen, came upon them with a Messiah who acted like he didn't care. In our text, we read that after a day of teaching, Jesus suggests that he and the disciples get in a boat and go to the other sea, side of the Galilean Sea. There was a great storm, and they were afraid, and to top it all off, Jesus was being useless. So useless, in fact, that he was napping. You know, in other accounts of this story, in other Gospels, it even says he was napping on a pillow. And the disciples are freaking out, thinking they're going to die. They look at their situation, and the story is not unfolding the way they thought it should, if Jesus is really who he said he was. So they wake Jesus up, saying, don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus then stilled the storm and asked a question. Where is your faith? You know, sometimes I've heard this story and thought that Jesus was mad at the disciples. Irritated, they woke him up and annoyed about their quickly fading faith. But that is not what the text says. Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. Not the disciples. I believe he kindly looked at them and asked, where's your faith? I mean, so many times this week, I have put myself in that boat and imagined the interaction between the confused, fear-filled disciples and Jesus. He calmed the storm, and then, then he looked into their eyes, their eyes still filled with terror and disorientation, and he reorients them with a single question. Where is your faith? Don't you imagine they looked him in the eyes? And Jesus knew. Of course he knew where their faith was. It was still rocking in the waves that had just threatened to swallow them and take them out completely. It was shaking from the thunderous, raging storm. Their faith was discombobulated by the image of their miracle-working leader napping while they were in real danger. Their faith was trying to get ahead of the next storm. They were fishermen. They knew that another storm could blow in at any moment and this time capsize them. So they are catching their breath, drenched with seaweed dangling from their limbs, looking into the dark waters surrounding them, and Jesus is asking them about faith. This is what the philosopher Nietzsche hated about Christianity. I've been thinking about Nietzsche this week, too, because my children read him in college, and he made sense to them. He wrote, You Christians, you Christians like your mother, Say that even when life is not going well, put your faith in God and things will change. Nietzsche says this is what is so abusive about Christianity. 
It prolongs the torment of our aching hearts. In fact, he calls this faith the evil of all evils because it puts us in torment. When my son started talking to me about Nietzsche, I thought I should disagree with everything he said. But he's actually putting his finger on something that matters to those of us who have been through a few storms. Think about your own lives. There's something you want that seems good. Maybe it's a meaningful job. A partner of love in life. Sobriety. A good relationship with your family. And you've wanted it for years. And you've done everything you know how to do to get it. And you still haven't gotten it. Isn't it foolish to have faith that this year you'll land that meaningful job? That next month you'll swipe on Bumble and meet the love of your life? That this time, sobriety sticks. Or that you'll gather with your family members in a few weeks for the holidays and they'll reveal that they've been going to counseling. And they want to really work on significant changes in relationships. I hear your laughs. I mean, does it make sense to have faith? That you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living? This is Nietzsche's point. Faith is putting your head in the sand and ignoring what life has already taught you. So stop wanting so much. When Jesus asked the disciples, just as the wind and waves are starting to settle, where is your faith? This is much like God's question in his first story about us in Genesis. You remember after Adam and Eve ate from the forbidden tree and God came to meet them in the garden and he called out, Where are you? This is a locating question. Not geographically locating. Because God certainly knew where Adam and Eve were. Just like he knew about the raggedy faith of the disciples in the storm-shaken boat. He is asking the most vulnerable question of all at the worst possible time. In the middle of a perfect storm of faith and fear. Where are you? Where's your heart? Do you want me? That's the first component of faith, wanting. Faith is letting yourself want. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. I have this theory about this story in Luke. It's my personal theory. I have not read this in a commentary. But it seems to me that this whole trip in the boat was a bit of a setup. I mean, if you go back to the text, whose idea was it that they go on this voyage in the first place? Jesus. After a day of preaching, he says to the disciples, let's get in a boat and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Was he caught off guard by the storm? I mean, after all, he's the weather maker. I am wondering if just maybe, just maybe he knew that it's in the middle of a raging storm in the middle of a tossing and turning sea while the boat was starting to shake and break. I'm wondering if he knew that would be the perfect time to locate them, to get to their hearts about a relationship that was more than about a relationship with a miracle-working Messiah, a genie in the bottle. As our pastor has so often said, 
Jesus is always creating the perfect context, the perfect storm, in which to demonstrate that he wants us even when we're good for nothing. He wants us when we're filled with fear and emptied of faith. He wants us when we're torn between worry and wonder. He wants us when we're breaking apart. He wants us when we can't stay sober. When we look for love in all the wrong places. When we yell at him and accuse him of not caring. He still wants us and oh, how he longs for us to want him when he seems like he's good for nothing. Napping on a pillow. When another storm hits, when he doesn't satisfy all our longings, when it seems like he's asleep and like he's not going to come through, where's your faith? As I put myself in the boat this week, I heard Jesus say, I still want you, Sharon, when you aren't sure of the goodness of God in the land of the living do you still want me? I mean, in his piercing gaze and poignant question, Jesus is asking, will you let yourself still want me? But that's not all that's contained in this question. He was asking, will you still want me? But he was also asking, will you wait with me? Because these fishermen knew there'd be another storm. Faith is allowing ourselves to want, but secondly, it is choosing to wait. Psalm 27 again. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be firm and take heart and wait for the Lord. You know, for those disciples, for the Hebrews... The body of water that had just threatened to drown them often represented an evil power that opposed salvation and God's plan to save them. They knew stories about storms. They'd heard of Noah and a raging flood that almost drowned the whole world. They knew about the Egyptians who had escaped within an inch of their lives through the raging Red Sea. They knew the story of Jonah, thrown into an angry sea and swallowed by a big fish. In Job, where God did take away everything he loved, it says that he trampled on the waters and he walked on the recesses of the deep. Even the psalmist uses water as a symbol of peril. He says, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. Raging seas and howling storms would have represented chaos and danger. And in the worst storm of their life so far, Jesus is asking the disciples, do you still want me? And will you wait with me? In fact, in just a few chapters later, he says to them, I guarantee you in this life, you will have storms. When he asks, where is your faith? When you are scared and disoriented, will you wait on me? I think Jesus made an appointment with this storm. It was the perfect timing. In the midst of wind and waves and lightning, Jesus knew it was the perfect time to talk about faith. When everything is breaking, maybe you've had a similar appointment. When everything is breaking, 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 not your boat, but your heart, your body, your business, your bank account, your family. 
Do you know that the place that God promises to wait is in the broken heart? What does that mean? I think it means that when my heart is breaking, it is necessary to wait so I can experience the presence of God. Psalm 27 again, I am sure I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The psalmist is saying in the land of the living, in this life, God will hear my cry and give me what I long for. Does that make you nervous? Or maybe you're sensing the agony of faith. Do you let yourself long for things you deeply want and have wanted for a while? Then you know faith is agonizing. Faith is longing for meaningful work while anticipating your first day on the new job. Faith is longing for a loving partner in life and envisioning yourself walking down the aisle. Faith is longing for your children to walk with God and anticipating that they will. Because if we don't reorient our faith when we're about to drown in circumstances we can't control, I mean, out of nowhere, storms are like that. Out of nowhere. One text message can change your life in 80 characters. That's the storm we can't predict. We can't control. But Jesus asked about faith then because he knows we are all too tempted to not wait, to take control. And in so doing, we create a second storm by our response to the first storm. I have some experience with this. We may find ourselves in the storm of depression. And when we're not willing to wait on him, we start drinking to get through it. I mean, depression is something that happens to many. I don't know anyone who hasn't had a season of darkness in their lives. But if we drive out darkness with darkness and depend on something in the darkness that's going to make me addicted, even when the light comes back on, I've created a second storm that's worse than the first. If my kids do something that makes me mad... Or breaks my heart. I can let my response create a storm that drowns out any evidence of Jesus. A lot of us are dealing with loneliness. That's a storm you can't control. But if we run to places in that storm that are more dangerous than the storm itself, if we run to a relationship to solve loneliness and, and compromise our values and character, the second storm may be worse than the first. That's the result of not wanting and waiting on him. So in the perfect storm, Jesus asks the locating question, the orienting question, where is your faith? Will you want me? Will you wait with me? And there's a third category implied in this question that is so filled with grace. With his understanding of our fear and disorientation in storms. He's asking, will you want? Will you wait? And will you wrestle with me? Faith is allowing ourselves to want. It's choosing to wait. And it is a willingness to wrestle. The story about the disciples in the storm says that in response to his question, after Jesus calmed the wind and the waves, the disciples were afraid. And they were amazed. They were caught between fear and wonder. That's wrestling. 
Maybe you found yourself in that place. I mean, this has been a year for me of fear and wonder. Fear that the next storm is right around the corner. Wonder if God does care. If he can change hearts and lives. If he will show up in the land of the living. That is wrestling. If we don't want and wait and wrestle, slowly but surely, we will deaden faith. It will ebb out with the tide of the storm. We say things like this. Well, it's a broken world. Or, I probably want too much. Or, you know, it's not going to happen until heaven. And in so doing... We numb or kill our faith in God to do the miraculous. Deadening our faith is saying, Jesus, I'm done. (laughs) No wrestling, no waiting, no wanting. It is just not realistic. (laughs) Have you been there? But what's the problem with that conclusion if we are truly believers in the story of Jesus? There is nothing more unrealistic than the resurrection. When our faith goes out to sea with the raging storms of life, we're denying the resurrection that God cannot bring dead things to life. Maybe, just maybe, right there in the boat, in that perfect storm, surrounded by the dark body of water, that to the disciples would have represented death. Jesus was foretelling that to be his follower, you will know something of death. But he wanted them to look at him and know they were sitting in the boat with the resurrection. I mean, are those questions that we wrestle with true? Is it a broken world? Yeah. But his broken body was resurrected. Are we going to have all our longings met in this world? Of course not. But here's the catch of faith. We don't know which ones. The question we must wrestle with is this. What can we trust God for in the land of the living? You see, we don't read these stories in the Bible just to have inspiration. God intends them to be incarnational. Can you put yourself flesh and blood in that boat with Jesus? Can you feel your soul weathered by storms? Your faith shaken by fear? The whole point of these stories that threaten to drown faith is that God sets an appointment to work in the middle of a raging storm. Here's how biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann put it. This quotation astounds me. He writes, storms are the arena of God's life-giving action. Can the storm of the present be the place of faith? The utter impossibility of the promise becomes evident in the storm, but people of faith, he concludes, do live in restless torment. So if you came here groaning this morning, you may just be a person of faith. Do you know something of restless torment? The war between the part of you that longs to believe Jesus is with you and actually cares? That wants to believe his presence is greater than the problem? And the part of you that looks around and sees all this evidence that God is not coming through. In Isaiah 49, God talks about how the Israelites who waited for 40 years, how they would 
one day know peace from all the storms they had encountered. He says, then you will know I am the Lord. Those who put their faith in me will not be disappointed. This promise is about knowing peace after being in exile, something very much in the land of the living. The difficulty is we don't know which of our longings God will meet in the land of the living, and we don't want to wrestle with God about that. This is why Jesus is asking the disciples about faith after the storm. His timing is perfect. They're wrestling with who Jesus is. What can he do? What will he do? What about the next storm? We cannot give in to faith until we have wrestled. Think about this. Surrender only comes in a moment of exhaustion. If you have not had those moments with your eyes wild with fear, your heart pounding from the wind and waves, faith shaking from disappointment, then you have not wrestled with God. And we can't talk about faith without talking about wrestling. Until you wrestle with God over the desires of your heart, until you bring your fear and anger and disappointment to him again and again and again, God will remain strangely impersonal to you. You may know him as the one true God, but you will not know him as those storm-shaken disciples did. You will not know him as the wrestler psalmist did. The God of my rescue. The God of my rescue. And so in his great kindness, after a raging storm, Jesus asked his disciples, where is your faith? Will you still want me to be your rescue? Will you wait on me for rescue? Will you wrestle with me about rescue? There was no shame or rebuke in this question. Jesus saw the yearnings of the disciples caught between fear and wonder. And he did not condemn them for looking at the dark waters around them, knowing another storm would surely come. He certainly did not admonish them to stop wanting so much. Because the very essence of rescue is not the absence of storms. But it is receiving the responsiveness of Jesus to the hurt in our hearts. The essence of rescue, it's not the absence of storms. It's receiving the responsiveness of Jesus to the hurt in our heart. Don't you see that's what happened in the boat that day? The rescue was not Jesus rebuking the wind and the waves. The rescue was the responsiveness of Jesus when he looked into the eyes of the fear-filled disciples and asked, Where is your faith? Where's your faith? Jesus did not ask this question so that we would try harder, do better, conjure up more faith. That is not how it works. Faith is a gift of God. And it is a gift, according to the Apostle Paul, who writes in the book of Romans, it is a gift that comes from raging storms. The apostle writes, faith comes from suffering. Ah, here is what we know what Nietzsche was talking about. We long for healing and help in an area of our lives. We've waited for that healing and help. And the healing and help has not yet come. And that is tormenting. Yet here we are this morning. Some of us still coming back to God. 
Our pastor's sermon last week took my breath away when he said that the angels in heaven are not impressed by someone walking on water or calming a storm or healing the sick. But the angels in heaven are astounded when people like me and you are located by Jesus in faith. We echo those faltering, storm-weary disciples who said, where else can we go, Jesus, but to you? Nietzsche calls that foolish. God calls it faith. Faith does not come from getting what I want, but from knowing I have a Savior who is deeply involved with the desires of my heart. I have a Savior who cares. I have a Savior who responds. I have a Savior who did not despise the storm of the cross. He did not despise the suffering on the cross. And I have a Savior who is thinking of me. A woman who so often is good for nothing. He was thinking of me when he rose from the dead. I'll finish this morning with this story from my college years. The big event at my college, one of the big events, was a Valentine's banquet, and I could not wait to go. I anticipated the dress I would wear, the corsage, the date, but as the day approached, I had not been asked. Well, the particular college I attended, which was way back in the olden days, we were required to go to dinner in the dining hall every night. And we were assigned to tables, four men and four women to every table, you know, to help the dating process along. And one night as I was walking out of the dining hall, I, I felt someone walking closely behind me. And I, I finally turned around and it was this guy from my table. His name is Jim. Now, Jim was not the most sought-after man on campus. But apparently, I was not the most sought-after woman. And Jim said, um, Sharon, um, Sharon, um, I'm Sharon, I wonder if you'll go to the Valentine's banquet with me. And I didn't know whether to feel relief or reluctance, but I said yes. And he said, oh, I'm so glad I've already asked every other girl at the table. Yes, humiliation fills me every time I tell that story. <laughs> and then I think of the humility of God. We ask everyone else at the table to be our source of faith and hope and love. And the thing that I cannot escape is that he never gets tired of waiting and wanting women like me. And he is never ashamed that he wanted me first. <laughs>